Now, for those of you who still believe it was Al Gore who invented the internet, he didn't. For those of you who believe it was our next speaker who invented the internet, he didn't. What he did do, however, is inventing the World Wide Web. And thereby, he basically changed all our lives. And he also changed the way we're going to introduce him, because on the World Wide Web, we found a clip that we uh, thought was a great quick summary of how this all happened. And we'd like to share it with you. Here you go. One and a half billion. That's the number of people who are now coming together in one place to learn, work and share their lives. It's a place we're all still building, minute by minute. The inventor of this giant virtual playground was an English software engineer, Tim Berners-Lee, who, lucky for us, in the 1980s was suffering from a serious case of information overload at work. Based at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Berners-Lee was trying to coordinate a mass of different data formats, research papers, and incompatible computer systems from contributors all over the globe. Berners-Lee daydreamed of a different way of organizing information, more useful, more intuitive, more human. Could he use his computer at CERN to create a space where any piece of information would be linked to any other piece of information in the outside world. He realized that to do this, he'd also have to link two ideas that had been knocking about quite separately for some time. The first was hypertext, which was a way of linking documents together using one word to immediately take you to another useful document. These hypertext documents were already commonly used on individual databases and CD-ROMs. The second idea was the internet, an internationally agreed method of allowing one computer system to send files, messages or data as packets of coded information to another connected computer. Berners-Lee needed to mash these ideas together to create a network of global hypertext, allowing linked data or documents to be accessible to anyone connected to the internet. He called it the World Wide Web. Never mind the world, if anybody was going to get linked up at all, Berners-Lee knew that the system would need rules to make sure everyone was speaking the same language. And so he wrote them. Every single piece of information would have an address, like a postcode, where the computer could find and retrieve it. The computers would talk to each other through a set of recognizable protocols, and a common language would mean that any document could be converted into an understandable format for any other computer. And that was it. No central mainframe, no giant bureaucracy, no corporate HQ. No one was going to control the web. It wasn't a physical thing to be owned. It was a space for everyone, and nothing, therefore, would be off limits. Those three rules that Berners-Lee had devised were in fact only there to ensure everyone's contribution from the grassroots up could exist and be linked to on an equal basis. And passionately believing those contributions mustn't be at the mercy of financial barriers or hierarchies, Berners-Lee gave his idea over to everyone to use. For free! <laughs> And after a cautious start, from the mid-90s, we all slowly went onto Berners-Lee's web and started making connections, and more connections, and even more connections. And each web page, like a neuron in the human brain, could free associate with other pages, revealing surprising relationships we couldn't predict, creating ideas that were insightful, empowering, and strangely entertaining. The weather in Mexico City. The future in the Arctic. The will of the crowd. The one-off blog. Every photo under the sun. News on demand. Shopping. Creating. Confessing. Dating. And from space, we can look down on it all and find ourselves. The world got smaller, but also surely more awe-inspiring than we ever knew before. Tim Berners-Lee is still out there right now. He's still passionate about his vision of ever more linked data 
of a semantic web that will not only connect information, but interpret it for us, and of a uniquely neutral space that must remain open to every single person. And the power of his daydream from the 1980s? Tim Berners-Lee has put the world at our fingertips, and we're hardly off the starting blocks. We're alive during a genuine revolution. Who knows what's next for the web? Well, we do, because its future is ours to keep creating. So, what are you waiting for? We are waiting for a genius to tell us what's happening next. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sir Tim Berners-Lee. We're honored to have you here. Merci. Merci for your hand. It's uh, nice to be back in Switzerland. So, uh, <laughs> you know, my first time, my first time I worked in Switzerland was actually in, on the Zugersee, the Kham, at the European Semiconductor Equipment Corporation, making robots. Well, making these, uh, the, the equipment that cuts up silicon wafers. Um, so, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And I've uh, always had a soft spot for Switzerland ever since. Uh, been in various places. Ten years in Geneva at CERN. Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you. Uh, I've been asked to talk about innovation. Okay, I'm going to, one of the things I'm going to try to do is to give you a framework for questions. Okay, after this, um, uh, we have a, a question and answer time. We will have a pa we'll sit on a panel. And I'm told that, well, you know, these people, they're all Swiss, and they're all in the financial industry, so that, you know, getting, for people to actually ask questions, well, I don't know if it's going to happen. But, so what you can do is, as you, uh, but you should uh, feel free to do that, and think of them as you go along, and note them down. So if I, uh, what I will try to do is go through things, maybe quite quickly, but uh, because I won't have time to go into everything. But... While I'm doing that, do, do make a note of things that you'd like to discuss afterwards. Uh, because that's, for me, in a way, the most, uh, the most exciting piece. So, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, innovation and technology. I'll go over, I suppose, a little bit of uh, what it was like to be at CERN, why, in a, for me, uh, innovation was possible then. I will, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the idea of platforms, because the internet was a platform there. The web is a platform, why the concept of a platform is important for, uh, in a, uh, for innovation. Um, I'll talk about some of the things, a few of the things coming down the pike, although, uh, of course, David's done a great job of going over a lot of them, and I won't need to go into many of them in great detail. I also, um, so, I'll, so I'll talk about you know, new devices, talk about data, uh, talk about how the world, uh, uh, about surviving in that, uh, that abstract world. And also, um, and I'll touch on the fact that also the web is not something that we can necessarily rely on. It's not, not necessarily something which is always going to be there just like it is there, unless we're, unless we're, really, um, unless we're really careful. So, to, talking about the, the innovation of the internet, yes. Great, it's wonderful, thank goodness it was set to, this to, to be set up by the people explaining, I'm explaining that I didn't invent the internet, because you know the internet was, that was 20 years before. So I was in CERN in 1989. 1969, Vint Cerf and Bob Karn and folks at Stanford were uh, developing this, the network, the way of connecting computers together so that you could send some data from this computer and it would be routed through other computers to the computer it was addressed to. And that, so they'd done that, they'd used it, to, you could log into another computer. 1971, Ray Tomlinson first took the email system on his, on, on his mainframe computer and put the at sign in between the computer name and the person and made the email run across the internet. So he took, so email then became internet email in, in 71 after the internet had been around for a few years, but 20 years when, uh, had gone by. And actually, well, the internet had spread really very strongly in the States, and 
in Europe, you can imagine, there was a bit of suspicious, a suspicion about it. It was regarded, it was not an ISO protocol. It was not, uh, so there was a feeling that it wasn't invented here. Uh, and it hadn't been gone through the official standardizations process. However, by, the, by 1989, it was just becoming acceptable in CERN to use the internet. By 19, so in 1999, yes, as the, uh, the video shows, there was a lot of information at CERN which was in quite a wonderful mess. I say wonderful mess. My dad always used to say, looking at our house, chaos is a symptom of life. And there was a lot of life at CERN and a lot of chaos. There was a life uh, and chaos at CERN because they came, people came from all over the world and they, were, they interacted as peers. There was no big hierarchy to tell everybody, you must all use the same computer. You must all use the same data format. So all, that's why there was such a heterogeneity. So we had a, a place which was, uh, had, which, which was exciting. It had smart people. It had funds to tackle a really difficult challenges. Uh, it was, had the problem of people having to coordinate internationally. It had the... Uh, it had also it had physicists who are naturally early adopters. They're geeks, and so they're happy to have. They typically they had more powerful computers on their desks than most people, uh, and so they had a lot of problems. But also had a lot of the capacity, and so in a way, CERN could be the ideal, uh, if you like, the ideal petri dish on which to launch the, the, the growth of the web as a mold. If you if you had to grow it, you had to grow the little web somewhere then the high energy physics community was quite a good early adopter uh, community. That, and also, my, I have to give credit to my bosses, uh, Pe uh, Peggy Rimmer and Mike Sendel. Mike is the person uh, who said at one point, uh, unofficially, why don't you go ahead with this machine, or with this idea? even though we can't officially justify it, why don't you spend the next few, time, few um, uh, months programming the thing? I had written a memo to, uh, which I'd circulated about the idea of the web but with it before I named it World Wide Web. Uh, and Mike, died, unfortunately, died about 10 years later. And when people went through his things, they found uh, a copy of that memo. And Mike's copy had written on the top of it, vague but exciting. If he had thought it was exciting but vague, maybe I'd ne he'd never have let me do it. But so that, so what's the point about this, about innovation? The great thing about Mike was he thought, you know what? It's a, it, it's a wacky idea, but it's important to let people every now and again find some time to do the wacky ideas. Um, and I, so you should make sure that everybody in your organizations do, uh, does that. So, um, so what I could do then is I, I, I had a, a Next machine. Does anybody here remember the black, these black? Anybody who used the Next machine? I think some of the people in financial services used them. It was a brilliant Unix machine that Steve Jobs produced. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a great, uh, wonderful machine, wonderful workstation. As a Unix machine, when you opened it, you put it on your desk, it had internet. I could write a program which ran on that computer, which would then talk to another computer across the internet. B because the internet was this platform which had been defined in a way that didn't determine what was done on top of it. When Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn designed the internet, they, made, they allowed you to send any stream of data for any purpose. They didn't design one great big email system. They didn't design it as a file system. They didn't design it as a virtual presence system. They designed first just a layer to allow two programs to talk to each other. And then they let anybody write any sort of program. And I just wrote a web server and a web client. So I defined, you know, they defined TCP and IP. When I defined the web, then those Tim's rules, they're called HTTP, the transfer protocol, HTML, URLs, those rules are the ones, you know, if, if you like, they cre those rules create the level playing field. The, if everybody talks HTTP, everybody talks HTML, everybody has URLs, these things that start HTTP, colon, slash, slash, that defines the web, it defines the information space. And that is a platform. On top of that, you can build all kinds of stuff. And so I tried, like as the internet pioneers had designed the internet as a platform, I tried also to rate the web as a platform, as something which does not dictate what is built on top of it, which just tries to be very general purpose. It had to, I realized it had to be universal 
a lot of projects at CERN had failed because they were only designed for one computer. I realized that the, the web had to run on any machine. It had to run on any operating system. It had to run across any combination of networks. It had to run in, work in any language. Uh, it had to be, uh, now one of the important things about it has always been that it's also as accessible as possible by people with disabilities. One of the nice things is that when you put a, web, a book on the web, you can put it on as a, in, in sound as well as in, uh, in text. So that the whole thing, spirit of it is universality. That universality is all designed to make it a platform. So why is in innovation important? Uh, why the platforms are important for innovation, then it's the fact that then they are solid building, building block for, uh, for putting your new idea on top. So I didn't have to know very much about how the internet worked. People who design websites now don't really have to worry about too much about how the web works. So, um, one of the it's worth uh, mentioning one other thing, one other aspect of it, of course, is the commercial side of it. Yes, it had to be for free. Lots of other uh, system, proprietary systems existed. They all competed with each other. If I had turned the web into WWW Incorporated, then they would um, uh, try to build it as a competitive but closed proprietary system there would have been immediately an XXX incorporated, a YYY incorporated, and a ZZZ incorporated. And those would have all been interoperable. They wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't have had the connections. We wouldn't be able to follow a link from anywhere to anywhere. The important thing about a hypertext link on the web is it can go virtually anywhere. That is really, it's a big ask. When you ask that much, you ask to be able to link to anything, that means you have to give away the, the right to, tra to tax it, you have to, uh, to, for it to grow very fast, you have to give away any central control. So designing the thing in a decentralized way with no central control was a really, really important part of that. And at, uh, at the time, after a few months, after 18 months, we managed to get CERN to write and have stamped by a director a document, which you can find on the web today, where, in which CERN says, we will not be charging royalties from this. And the internet companies that built the web from that, they did not patent and charge royalties. Even big companies, which had, been, uh, which, which had made a huge amount of money, uh, a little bit like one of the companies, which I won't mention on David's slide, which has some of these companies really had, had huge legal departments, which were separate from engineering. Then they really, what happened during the growth of the web was the engineering department said, wait, you know, you guys, if you keep suing people, if you make this a patent, if you make this, a, this space prickly and unsafe with patents, then we can't launch our products because our products need to spread across the web where everybody can use it for free. And so there was a massive realization among all the IT companies that the internet protocols, the rule book, have to be a, a, a royalty-free space. So that's another, so the royalty-free thing is a really, really important part of the, innovat uh, the innovative landscape. And keeping that, the, the, it's royalty free now. The World Wide Web Consortium, which is a group of companies and individuals and organizations which are developing the technology, it has a policy that every, all the standards it produces are royalty free, but it's sometimes really hairy and takes a lot of negotiation uh, and uh, a lot of uh, important process to get, uh, uh, to, to keep it royalty free. So, on top of that, so that's what platforms could one build on top of it? Because when you innovate, don't just use platforms, it's always a good idea to make another platform. One of the platforms that's been built on top of it is the Open Web Platform. This is, if you might have heard of HTML5. So yeah, HTML is the, is, is the markup language for hypertext. HTML5 is very, is really not uh, just about documents. Yeah, but uh, HTML, there's a language that a web page comes in, but now, because HTML comes with JavaScript, it's actually a program. So um, uh, the change from the original web, which was really a web of documents, to the current web of the open web platform is that every web page is like a computer. Every, instead of web pages linking passively, every web page can be programmed just like a computer. And in fact, with, this, with web RTC, web real-time, communication, RTC uh, standards that have come along, web pages will be able to talk to each other with peer-to-peer -peer protocols. 
So you'll be able to, between one, you're in a one you, web page on your website, you'll be able to make it look like a, a, a video conference website. You'll be able to get people talking video. You'll be able to get applications running, exchanging data in real time between each other. So if you've got analysis programs, people running analysis programs, they'll be able to, th then those programs will be able to exchange ideas, exchange notes. You can build social applications. So that's a huge change from a web page being a document to being a web page being a computer. It's called the Open Web Platform, HTML5. There's lots and lots of also within that. Lots of JavaScript, there's lots of power uh, of p powerful facilities which are then given to the programs. So, uh, and in fact, when you write a program as a web page, increasingly the web page is becoming as powerful as any other is any other computer, and particularly on mobile, when you write a mobile web page, the mobile web page will be as, is becoming as powerful as a mobile app. So we, while people have been very excited about mobile app, m apps, in fact, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a pain to have to write them as an engineer, because you have to write one for Android, and one for iPhone, and one for each operating system, whereas if you make a web page, make a mobile web, page, make mobile web app, then it works on all machines. So that's uh, uh, so uh, now coming coming down the pike. Then of course the, uh, there are huge changes, some of which have already been mentioned. Let me go into just let me talk a little bit about the, the devices. Originally, when the web came out, everybody looked at the screen pretty much on things like this big or this big. They were VGA or they were 800 by 600 pixels. And some web pages said, please set your screen to 800 by 600 pixels before using this website, because this website is designed for 800 by 600 pixels. All right. And we spent ages trying to persuade people not to do that, saying, no, you've got to make your website so that it works with any size. And they, you know, what they meant is, you should use, get a new fancy 800 pixel wide screen. Well, actually, uh, you know, obviously, well, various things <laughs> changed their mind. One was that suddenly the, pixel, the screens got bigger and bigger and bigger. But also they got smaller and smaller and smaller. And so now, with uh, mobile devices starting off with having quite small screens, now having quite large screens, now having all kinds of screens, obviously, the size of the screen has got to be really uh, it's got to be something which is irrelevant to your site. Obviously, you've got to be able to service somebody who comes to your site through anything, and you've got to, through any of these, any, any device. And devices are getting more and more diverse. They are getting smaller. You know, I haven't yet browsed the web on a phone, or, or on a watch, but I'm sure I will, and I imagine that you in Switzerland may feel that you ought to be among the first to actually do it. After all, it's a watch. So, uh, but, but supposing I'm booking, I'm, use, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm, I'm booking a flight on my watch. Now, I come into, I, when I get home, actually, if I've got another screen around, if I've got a laptop screen, I want to be able to very quickly transfer the process of booking the flight onto a screen where I've got a little bit more space and I can use the keyboard. But also, if I'm talking about the flight I'm going to take to all my colleagues and I'm in a conference room, well, then maybe I want to use this big screen. Now, sometimes when you, you know, when you go to different conference rooms now, and when you go to theaters, this screen, uh, this is nice, but they get bigger and bigger, and they get cheaper and cheaper. So in fact, it's quite reasonable to fill this entire wall with pixels. Make it all big, one big screen. That's happening. Soon, you won't worry about deciding on the colors of the walls. <laughs> you just project, change, <laughs> decide later. Uh, that, so that now what happens when, I'm, when, I, when I walk into my room? Imagine that I walk into my house. I've got a room which has got, where the walls are all pixels. I'm booking a flight. What do I, how can I use that? Yeah, I expect now it's not just booking the flight and how much it's going to cost. I expect to see pictures. of. I, I expect to see a map I expect, uh, with the flight. I expect to see pictures of where I could go. There will probably be ads for where I should get my hotels with lots of di uh, in, in different spaces. So learning to use a really, really powerful, uh, very, very in, you know, high pixel, very, very intense, uh, powerful user, inter uh, user interface devices is going to be one of the things that we'll have to do, just as we have to learn how to use it when it's very constrained. And we're, and we're, doing, you know, we're trying to 
get something across to somebody while they're driving, or you know, with the, while their robot is driving for them, or while uh, they're using a small display. So, and in fact, you can imagine that these pixels, they're getting, uh, they're getting, the screens are getting bigger, they're also getting very high resolution. So as they get cheaper, they, they get to the point that, the retina point, as Apple call it, the point where it doesn't really matter how many pixels there are because you can't see them anyway. It's like when, you remember, everybody used to fight about who had the best hi-fi, stereo, maybe you're not old enough. But there was a time, let me tell you, young people, that when, you know, when people would be very proud of the fact that their stereo system had a total harmonic distortion, which was so low that the ear, you, know, you couldn't hear the difference between a violin playing on the tape, on the, on the quarter-inch tape deck, and the, and the real violin. Well, OK, but once it had got to that stage, then stereo systems got cheaper and cheaper. And the fact that you actually had a sort of a hi-fi stereo was no big deal. And similarly, you can imagine that happens so that, yeah, I get, you get used to the fact that when you walk into an area, uh, when you're looking at a screen, that you won't be able to see the pixels. It will maybe cover your entire, everywhere you look. Maybe it'll be stereo. And so that, that's a completely different programming environment, very different, a very powerful way of, um, uh, way of interacting with data, clearly. Also, uh, by, by that time, computer artificial intelligence, intelligence will get pretty uh, powerful. The, the graphics, which renders people, uh, you know, the avatars that you see in things like Second Life are at the moment sort of a little bit, they look like cartoon characters, but bit by bit, they're coming, becoming very good. And there will come a point where you can meet, where you can produce a virtual person. When you look on the screen, you see a virtual person who will be, where it'll be really hard to decide whether it's a real person or whether it's an artificial intelligence, whether it's an avatar which has been generated. You've seen maybe some, you know, on the movies, you can see pretty good, pretty interesting characters have been generated completely by, uh, by computer, and that's coming, that'll come to real time. So there'll be all kinds of interesting things will hap be able to happen. Maybe you'll be able to go to a conference as an avatar. Maybe you'll, you know, yes, somebody I guess in the uh, I got in the morning was telling you how it's a really good idea to leave all your gadgets behind you for a while, and I agree. It's a good idea to do that. But on the other hand, also, it's kind of a good idea to think, how can, how can we really take these gadgets to the limit? Uh, so, <laughs> so if we, t okay, so suppose, I, we were, we were gonna, you were going to do this talk, and, and I was going to come back next year, and that, but I was going to do it remotely. Suppose I was going to stay wherever I was, was in the world, and you'd give me, a, and you'd get the highest bandwidth, you get the best pixels. What would you really need for it to feel like I'm here? Would it be okay to have a sort of holographic projection or a stereo image? Would I need to be able to jump so you can feel it? We could probably do that. How much, how much does it take of technology to mean that I could actually do this and feel just as connected with you without actually having to get on a plane? I think people will be divided. I think, I, you know, I agree that meeting face-to-face -face is really important, but these device changes are going to be, uh, are going to be really, uh, r really uh, pretty amazing in some of the things that, we'll, that we will be able to do. And maybe, and if we could actually save um, the carbon cost of going, going in planes, that's also quite a uh, useful thing. And so, one of the effects of all this, when you, when you step back and you realize that all the computing has got to be done independent of all of the devices, that means the way that the the whole world interacts is not going to be through documents, really. Documents, you know, this document, the A4 page, is a wonderful thing. But, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's very much of the paper era. When, and in fact, the, you know, the concept of a flight, is of a particular flight number, is an abstract concept. It's, uh, you know, it's, got a, it's got a number, there's all kinds of information about it I could get. And so, in fact, what's running through the thread that's running through my life as I'm doing things with that flight, as I'm calling somebody about it, and I'm sh you know, p cutting and pasting it, and I'm booking it, and I'm booking the hotels at either end, that it's all data. It's all actually abstract. The web becomes just a vision onto this world. And David talked a lot about this world of big, uh, of big data, which is coming and has come. So obviously, in the financial sector, yes, everything's data. You know that, you work with data. Everything you deal with is abstract. The, work, the things that you deal with 
will connect or like the pro when you the, the products made by the companies you invest in those will all be defined by data if they're not defined by data then they won't exist because the buying the buy, when people buy products when they buy tires they're not going to go looking on websites you remember the time you know, yes originally there was a time when they used to go and have play golf with the person who you know, has the tire company and there would be a human connection and then there was a time when they would go on the web but then as when the world goes to this abstract world of data that buying is going to be done by a computer. So the, if your product in the, uh, information isn't available on the web, your company won't exist. The product won't exist. The machines will just pull in all the available offers for tires and we'll find the best deal and then buy the tires. So that is a massive change. It's actually a change which you know, I've been trying to push for ages. I've been, 2009, I spent the whole a lot of the years trying to get people to put data on the web. Not just pictures of data, but the underlying data. Uh, pushing data journalism, getting people, getting governments to put open data out there, getting journalists to ask for the data, analyze the data, and explain it to people. So, uh, the, this has been, in a way, the world of data, of, of data has been um, uh, coming for a long time. Uh, it hasn't come as quickly as I, I'd like, but it's partly because people, no, they, they, they felt that, uh, they, well, even search, com search engine companies at one point said, no, 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 we won't be exchanging data because our machines are so good at reading human, human web pages, human readable web pages, that we don't need that. But then, a few years later, when you Google something, you get this bar down the side, you get this box on the side appears. And it starts off as a small box. You Google for Paris Hilton. That's the classic one because is it the hotel? Is it a hotel or is it the person? It, and you used to get a bunch of web pages about mm, some of them about the person, some of them about hotels, some of them about Paris. But then now you get a block about Paris Hilton, the person. You get a block about Hilton hotels, maybe. And the machine knows, and it gives you information, person information about people, and it gives you hotel information about hotels. Because actually, the search engine, rather than just looking and read, you know, pointing you a picture, at, uh, just pointing you at web pages written by humans for humans, uh uh, that's not what's going on. What's going on is the search engine company is building up a big knowledge of the world. It's building up a semantic knowledge of the world. It's being, well, when it builds up a, its data, it's, and it's not just accumulating lots and lots of data, like lots and lots of uh, meteorological data. You know, it's not big data in that sense. It, it's semantic data. It's data where the machine knows what sort of thing you're talking about. And it understands, has a whole lot of data about how that is connected to other things. So we're talking about the world of sort of machine knowledge and the search engine companies, even though they don't expose that data to you, you can see from the results that they're using it internally. So more and more, yes, in a way, the financial, the financial sector should be ahead of the field because you have to use data because all your, everything you deal in is pretty abstract anyway. You'll see other, all the other industries also will become data-oriented. And the people who can manage that and in particular, who could join data from one place to another. They, those, the people who can not just have, have a, you know, a stream about one particular thing, but have got the smarts to be able to see how that relates to that and connect that to that. Yeah, it's a bit like the web. You know, linked data is, is, is it's like linked documents, except it's in a way much more powerful. So when you link it together, that's when you get the insight. And that insight will be something which some companies will get, and some can, <coughs> companies um, uh, won't. So, um, so I th personally, I think that it's a really exciting future. I agree that um, I just would we'll pick up on one thing the previous speaker mentioned about robots. Uh, and like a lot of people, in a lot of a lot of the books, uh, the Asimov books, which I read when I was a kid. The question people ask is, when, okay, so the computers become powerful, the robots uh, become more intelligent. At which point do the robots start overtaking humans? And at which point should, the human, should robots 
the, the critical thing is when are they given actual legal status? When are they, when, you know, should we get to the point, are they, will they get so smart that they could, they, a robot should be given uh, rights as a social entity? Um, well, what would you have? If you, what happens if you, if you took a robot and you said, you know, we'll give them the rights of a human being, we'll give them the sort of, we'll, we'll make them an entity that, uh, which isn't human, uh, but does, uh, doesn't, uh, has, uh, doesn't have the, the physical properties of a human being, but in law has the ability, for example, to take on responsibility and to sue people. What would we have if we took a robot and gave them, oh, we'd have a corporation. Oh, we already have corporations. So in fact, wait a moment, rewind, 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 rewind. Wait a moment, we have already set up these things called corporations which have got, um, which they're, they're not robots, they don't have arms and legs, but they do have financial, uh, they, 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 they have a financial existence, they have a social existence, they can uh, do, they have public relations, they operate, they have the, they have the rights in America, they have the rights to uh, the self-expression just like a human being. And so how does this relate to robots? Well, you know, a lot of your companies are becoming run more and more by, co by, by computers. So maybe what you need to be looking for is not that you have a shining robot with a, uh, you know, which walks about um, make, doing things on the manufacturing line, which, is, which then becomes, that gets the rights of human beings. You have your, but you find that companies, suppose, imagine that you have the, the, the directory, the register of companies in Switzerland gets an API, so that if you want, gets an application program interface, it exposes uh, a way of, uh, that, that a computer can talk to it. Supposing the protocols are set up so that you can run a program, and if you want to start a new program, a new, a new company, all you have can do is, all you have to do is run a program which will talk to the registry of companies, go through all the legal things, and create the new company. Ha! Ah, then you have a company, if the company is run by, one company is run by a computer, ha! Ah, it can now create new companies. You have re robots that can reproduce. So maybe <laughs> one of the things we should do is go through, back through all the Asimov stories about uh, whether, about all the concerns about g giving robots uh, the rights, the uh, legal rights, and think about how, how that occurs, when in fact what's happening is we already have companies, we already have corporations that have their own legal rights, and they are being run more and more by computers, as David said. When that happens, you know, any, when you make any of these platforms, when you make any of these systems, what's interesting is not really the microscopic thing. It's not that you can buy and sell stocks. It's not that you can download something from a web page. It's the big system. You know, it's with the web, it's that, it's, it's that there is this huge knowledge existent this information space of human knowledge on the web. With the linked data, it's that there is this massive thing like a big database. When you look at things like that, obviously, from the, if you're in the financial sector, then you know that, you know perhaps with a little bit of, uh, with a twinge every now and again, that, things, that, that it's not always obvious how to make, this, make sure the system is stable. And that's true of other systems too. Yeah, the financial system, everybody, you know, has, they have got, they've got lots of models for how the economy works, and then suddenly, plunk, oof. Okay, new models, we need some new models. We're going to get going. We have some new models that's going. The economy goes up, and then suddenly, and then nobody expects it, because the models don't actually work. Well, what about, so, what about Twitter? That's the that's that, that, that's system. What about, you know, people, when people tweet, one of the unfortunate things, maybe, is the, that if I tweet something, You'll, you'll, the Twitter works by, I tweet something, you retweet it, and if, lots of, and if it's the sort of thing that excites people, it will get retweeted and it will spread, and lots of people will see it. Now, what sort of thing is retweeted? Well, things that excite you. So that you, what happens is Twitter is full of things that people think are really cool or really exciting or really, or make them really angry, or make them really helpful. So Twitter, in a way, maybe is an amplifying medium for, particular, for emotions. If you, if you say something which is very reasoned and, <laughs> and in fact, a really well-expressed, balanced uh, statement about the world, which really would help the country or the world come to a more reasonable conclusion, it's not likely to get retweeted. 
Maybe in a different Twitter. Maybe if we built Twitter in a different way, a new, if we built a new system, maybe we could build new systems where really well thought out I, you know, comments which really help us build, run a democracy will actually be, uh, will be retweeted more. So we can build new systems, but meanwhile, we, one of the things that we haven't really done very much, some people I know at MIT are doing it, but is looking, is looking at something like Twitter and saying, let's do some analysis on this. Let's think about it like, suppose it was, and, and, and I like, look at it like an international financial system, would it melt down? What would be the equivalent? Well, maybe on Twitter you could get a conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories, they don't know what sort of problems with the human race. People believe conspiracy theories for some crazy reason. They believe, once they've been told that you know, giving viruses to their kids may be a bad idea, ah, it's just crazy, all the science in the world, you can't dissuade them that they think that this, they, 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 they believe the conspiracy. So, suppose, so could Twitter allow somebody to spread some conspiracy theory with really detrimental effects? We've seen what happens when somebody attacked the White House using social networking. They, they, they created a false rumor on Twitter, and it affected the, you know, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped as a result. Okay? You, we know also that a lot of people are using the Twitter, the feed from social networking, to, in, to be really smart about advanced the inf information to drive their investments because they see that the rumors on Twitter are slightly ahead of what you get out of Reuters and AP. You can, get, you can discover when people are, gonna get, are getting sick with the flu before the doctors know because people Google for flu and start discussing it on Twitter. So you, if you buy pharmaceutical stocks when people start talking about flu on Twitter, then you can be ahead of everybody else and you can make starting money. You can, start making money, and you're part of a system which could be really unstable. Because then somebody just only has to start tweeting about, pharma, about pharmaceuticals, and you'll buy pharmaceutical stocks, and then, they'll, and, they, all right, and then they'll laugh about it, and they'll expose that it was just a sham, and the whole thing will plunge, and they thought it short. And, you know, so this, uh, these people putting together pieces, pe people together, putting these together systems, which each of which looks like a really good idea. But nobody is doing the analysis of the, uh, s uh, of the whole of the stability of the whole system. And in fact, I would encourage you to. And if you've got really smart people who are doing the analysis for your trading systems, get some of them to think not just about whether this works for us in this environment, but if everybody runs this program, what does it do to the planet? And especially, you need to do that analysis if your system is not if you're not just running within one system. You're not just trading one sort of thing, but actually you're connecting to other feeds of data from other parts of the planet, like your feed, you know, connecting to a particular to weather, uh, to, to, to uh, weather data, or, or, or worse, to data which are actually other people like Twitter, which people can affect. So there, so that, there's my, uh, there's, I suppose, some of my uh, greatest c uh, concerns about it, uh, and I, I, I don't end up with a mixture of sort of hope and, and concern, which I hope in a way that you'll take home. The, this innovation requires on the, 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 the platforms to work, and the important thing about it was they were universal. The great thing about the web is that if somebody starts a business, they have an idea, they can start a web, they can start a web server, and anybody can connect to it. That is because on a good day, on a normal day, the internet service providers just operate as a platform, as a neutral platform. The internet service providers will, if, you, if I set up a, w a website selling independent films, for example, I make my own films, I can sell those movies to you. You can go and watch them, stream them back to your house, just as you go to big Hollywood movies. You go to, through Netflix and so, Sony and so on. The internet connects us all. I can compete with Netflix and Sony and, uh, and Hollywood. And if my, uh, and yeah, if I have to pay for, if, if a lot of people like my movies, then I have to pay to, uh, for the bandwidth to be able to upload them. But by that time, hey, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm making money. I'm making movies. So that is the wonderful, you know, for, for innovative world, 
You need to have that neutrality. The net neutrality of the net is really, really important in innovation. But in a way, even more importantly, it's not just engineering and business we do on it, it's education, it's democracy we do on it. We're using this, for this platform for, all, for a huge amount of our lives. We go and reach for the web. We Google something just in the middle of a conversation when we're trying to figure out, we're trying to explain something to our kids, when we're trying to out who to vote for, we're trying to figure out what's real, what really happened. It's really because we depend on this thing so much, because so many people now go to the doctor for a second opinion, but they go to the web for the first opinion. It's, you know, it's really important that the web is, a, is neutral. And recently, of course, uh, the folks discovered that actually you can click on something and there will be somebody in America <coughs> who's watching. Well, it's not somebody, it's a person, it's a robot, but, you know, but, but there, people have realized that there's been a lot of spying going on. And so there's been a lot of discussion about that. But in general, in fact, if we use the web, it, the fact that it's a neutral medium is so important. If you're using it, then you need to spend a certain little part of your time making sure that you're doing your bit politically with your, your organization, with your, with your company, to make sure that it stays neutral. Keep the neutral thing. What we need is a web which is not spied on. Or if it's spied on, it's spied by people we by the police that in, a, in a way that, that we can trust. It's not blocked, it's not censored, except for things which we all agree on internationally as being completely illegal, like child pornography. Okay, so basically no spying, no blocking. Uh, we keep uh, an open internet, and hopefully also one of the things we're pushing through this year, because this year is actually, this March is the 25th anniversary of when I wrote the first, that first memo about the web, that one that Mike wrote, vague but exciting on. That was 25 years ago, and what we're trying to get people to think about 25 years on, what sort of a web do they really want? What sort of, you can go to webyouwant.org, even. And uh, we need, so we need to think about, do we want a web which is open? Do we want a web which is, has freedom, free in the sense of freedom? Uh, do we want a web where we're not worried about spying? Do we want a uh, web where we're not worried about fraud? How and how are we going to put that together? The important questions of 25 years, it's time for all of us to think about it, and I'll ask you all to do that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> I have to say this avatar vision is quite scary if you think about identity theft, isn't it? <laughs> how, how are you going to ensure this in future? <laughs> how, how do I know you're real? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, it's quite scary. Um, uh, only... Um, I experienced once how someone stole my identity in mm. a very in, 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 in just setting up a Facebook profile, which was me, and doing some stuff with it. But I mean, what you said that in future we, we really will be unable to distinguish between the real person and mm. the avatar. That is actually quite a scary vision, don't you think? <laughs> or yes. are you totally excited about it? I actually, Both. my first thing was like, oh, sounds scary. Well, well the legal thing. So now somebody could uh, set up. 200 uh, SLRs, uh, synchronized SLRs around you now, take a photograph of you, more pictures, put all the pictures around you, go home, analyze it, and build a three-dimensional model of you, which they could then use to produce you in any, they would, uh, could then take somebody else's dance and put your, make your body do it so in a movie. So one of the things <laughs> that we need to get to make sure is that if you end up in a movie in the future, that you get the royalties for it. Oh, oh <laughs> right. God, and your inventions are partly responsible for it. No, 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 no. <laughs> there's, 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 there have been lots of people noting all sorts of horrible things. Oh. But uh, the web was just one of them. But, but talking anyway. about inspiration, because it was a very inspiring speech, um, uh, you are being considered to uh, be someone who inspires many other people. Um, whom are you inspired by? Who inspires you? Who or what? I think there have been a whole lot of people. Um, actually, the... the there's, there have been some people, you know, famous people, I, uh, I suppose, but in fact, the people involved in hypertext I didn't really meet till after the web. But, um, the thing I find most, uh, I think, uh, that sort of sends chivalrous to my, that down my spine, if I think about it, is the way when I sent out those first messages out across the 
internet news service, which was this pre-web thing, out to various people who are involved, like who, who are interested in this sort of thing. I get back these messages from people I never knew, hmm. who were would look at the look at my message and think, you know what? If everybody did that, if everybody put up a web server, it would be really cool. So I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. So the people who just, in, when they're in this situation, if everybody did this, it would be great, did it? It's like picking up litter in the woods, you know. Every, obviously in Switzerland, everybody picks it up, everybody picks up litter. Other countries, they don't. The people who, uh, who job they would, what they were doing and spent mm, just a certain amount of their time putting together the first web servers, writing the first uh, software, they're very varied. They're a hugely diverse group. They became this white, crazy collaborative mm. um, uh, group of people internationally who helped put the early web together. Those, uh, I think those, the, you know, those folks in their, in their vari variety are incredibly inspiring. And they still are working with them now. You, you, know, you never know when, who in this, when you set up a working group to decide on a new standard. People come from all over the place and uh, of all different sizes, shapes and sizes, mm. and they just do it because you know, they help because they think it would be a good idea. Mm. That side, that, that's that's been that, that spirit has been the most inspiring thing. Uh, <coughs> um, talking about cooperation or collaborating. Um, all morning throughout the day, uh, we mentioned very often how astonishing this whole development has been, how surprised everyone was by uh, the, uh, the volume of data exchange, the speed, how all this happened, what happened in just five or eight years. Um, did you have any conception when you started out what an extraordinary phenomenon that would be? Well, in fact, I did have a model of it and, and sort of planned more or less how it should, how it should take off. Uh, and I sort of planned that, that we should sort of get the web, for the software should go out and people should start populating the web and, and planned. And I thought that probably, you know, after sort of about 25 years, I'd probably be giving a, maybe a talk, maybe in one of the, in Europe, maybe somebody in, uh, in Switzerland. But I thought it was going to be tomorrow, not today. I got it. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, of course, I couldn't. The main, you know, the thing was doing this uh, exponentially, you know, it was growing exponentially. Lots of projects do this. Okay, or they do this, or they do that. Lots of other projects have done that. So we were just worried, just trying to think, you know, what's going to trip this up? What do we have to do next? Do we have to get another community involved? Do we have to, should we spend time talking to developers? Should we talk to, to, talking to content people? It's, so it's never really had the time to, uh, uh, to wonder about where it's going. Just, just. just to keep, it in one, keep it one web keep it together, keep it open, uh, and, and also, I'd like to a certain extent, <laughs> did today, sort of jumping in, up and down, trying to get people to make sure that they help keeping the web open. Uh, this is something we're going to talk about in our round table, also in uh, the question how open governments are, because this is a, another concern of you that you're working towards. We can do this just after our next break, uh, the last break. Thank you so much. Sir Tim Berners-Lee. <laughs> we'll see you in 15 you. minutes. <laughs> yeah, and as I said, we're just going to take a uh, last break. If you have any questions for Tim and, of course, for other, other experts, uh, please memorize them or write them down. And we will meet again in 15 minutes for our roundtable discussion. Th see you then.